Hey, thanks for joining us today. It's really nice to see you after all this time. I do want to point out that I am wearing my universe wrap with the, uh, for you, especially uh, just for, for you. I thought you might enjoy it. Uh, did you order that from someplace beyond the planet? I mean, it's an <laughs> extraterrestrial garb. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I found it honestly when I was so excited to have had a new baby that I wanted her to look at the stars while she was breastfeeding. So that's what I got it for. But now you can look at the stars that's while perfect. we're having a conversation. I got to order it on Amazon. <laughs> Don't you dare, especially not today. You know All that right. Jeff, Jeff Bezos is a classmate of mine. No. Well, maybe not a classmate. He, he's a, an alumna. Anyhow, never mind. Doesn't matter. Did you know him personally? Is he? No, no, I've spoken with him, but I, I don't know. Him. Well, he, he's, he seems kind of distant. He's sort of like yeah. Zuckerberg and those guys. They're, yeah. They're in a shell. Yeah. He doesn't want to be with the little people like Seth Shostak, oh. the director of the search for in extraterrestrials at the SETI Institute, who we are speaking with right now. <laughs> hey, at a time like this, when the Earth's existence is threatened by the very humans who call this planet home, UFOs probably seem like a far off problem. But there's a new documentary out right now. And in it, former Senate Majority Leader and person not known to be kind of a wingnut, Harry Reid, says that the U.S. government has been hiding key details about UFOs for years. Here with us today is SETI Institute's Seth Shostak to discuss. Seth, thanks for joining us on the program. Well, it's a pleasure, Julian. It really is. What do you make of Harry Reid's comments about the federal government covering up, covering up information it has about UFOs? Well, look, this is not a new position from Harry. Uh, he has been, you know, sort of on the side of, well, they're actually here. And in that, he's not, you know, he's, he's not- Maybe a, like the, like aliens or- Yeah, yeah, yeah. One third of the population agrees with Harry Reid, right? One third of the population, I, I'm not talking about politically, about reelecting him, but they agree with his position on this that in fact the aliens are not just out in space but they're here you know buzzing the uh, buzzing the planet and they're ufos it, it's not a fringe movement it sounds like something you know the crazy people who think there's a guy at the north pole who's going to bring them presents at the end of december hey and, <laughs> well <laughs> I my belief system <laughs> <laughs> but it, i mean he was behind this uh well the 22 million dollar project that the government funded to look into these things uh, uh, supposedly canceled at the end when they didn't find anything very interesting, but in fact, apparently still going. So Harry, Harry's a known uh, a known quantity on this issue, this hot button issue that you know our our skies are not safe. We've talked about UFOs before. You you and I have talked about UFOs, and a lot of times you say, well, you know, it could be any number of things, not necessarily just aliens. What are the other things that perhaps we are mistaken for? you know, aliens just because it's unidentified. Yeah, well, there's a whole laundry list. I mean, the evidence is presented, right, and that Harry Reid likes to uh, encourage by funding programs to look into this are mostly sightings, photographs, videos, the most famous ones being uh, those videos that were published in 2017 on the front page of the New York Times, uh, you know, showing these videos made by Navy fighter pilots from their jets with these high high tech infrared cameras. Oh, do we have a photo of it? I think we do. Here it is. Well, okay. yeah, that one doesn't look familiar, but it looks similar to what you see. So there's and flying uh, uh, flying stingrays in the air, is basically. <laughs> well, I mean, that's going to be uncomfortable unless you have a really thick bathing suit. That's going <laughs> to be awful. Yeah, I haven't seen that photo before, but it's very similar. You can see, you know, uh, something in the photo that doesn't look right. You're flying stingray. But that looks to me actually like an optical problem in the uh, in the camera. There's the camera's obviously looking at something very bright. They block that out in the middle, and that causes reflections in the mirrors. You don't care about all that technology, but this is typical of the kind of evidence presented. It it, it could be aliens, and it could be reflections in the camera. Now you work for SETI, right? You act. You don't just work there, but you well, are. I don't yeah, just work you there. direct. Well, you know, uh, you direct some of the work that goes on there, right? Some of it, some of it, but but the 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 point is that this seems sort of incongruent because on the one hand, what we're doing is we're trying to find aliens by 
you know, eavesdropping on their, their radio broadcast, for example, uh, other ways as well. And yet I'm very skeptical that photos like this prove that somebody's up in the skies. I think you should ask the CEO of Delta Airlines, who's in the news quite a bit these days, you know, you could ask him, well, you know, you're going to resume service as slowly as the pandemic uh, eventually gets <laughs> beaten. But how can you do that? How can you put airplanes in the air if there are really, you know, unidentified flying objects zipping around? I mean, isn't that dangerous? And he will probably just chuckle and, and go on to your next question. Uh, Seth, let me ask you a question that's related to our current situation. First of all, you're in California and you have a number of, you know, there's a lot of high tech equipment that is involved in listening for radio frequencies from uh, extraterrestrials. How have the fires and the smoke from the fires affected uh, the SETI Institute? Well, fortunately, they have not. I mean, you know, you know, there's an indirect effect because where I am in the Silicon Valley, just south of San Francisco, the fires are, are not in my neighborhood. The fires, are, of course, are in the forest. Now, the forests are not very far away. Probably the nearest fire uh, to me was maybe 10 miles away, 20 miles away, something like that. Pretty close. But, you know, that doesn't burn you down. It doesn't you know, destroy your house. What it does do is <laughs> make breathing a little more difficult. There's that. It hasn't interfered with the science that we do. Because remember, a radio telescope doesn't care that the air is smoky because it's, you know, it's looking for radio waves and they go right through all that stuff. So fortunately, it hasn't happened. But in the past, it has. Uh, there have been fires in the past that got very close to the observatory. And, you know, it could just turn it all into a heap of smoldering ash. Mm -hmm. Hasn't happened yet, but it came very close a couple of years ago. Uh, has uh, President Trump's reign, uh, we like to call it here, has it had an effect on the funding of institutes like SETI? Well, that's a kind of curiosity. Well, it is curious, put it that way, because, in fact, it hasn't. You know, uh, I Thank think the, I think, yeah, you would you would think that he would say, well, look, you know, this is all very interesting, but we've got other concerns like, I know, you know, we got to build a wall or something. We need all the money we can. Well, to begin with, there is no federal funding of SETI anymore. That was canceled by Congress back in 1993. So, you know, there isn't any direct Who was money. the president in 1993? Yeah, well, it wasn't done by the president. It was done by the Senate, actually. And um, yeah, the president did, probably didn't know anything about it. But I will say, from the political point of view, it is kind of interesting that the UFO crowd, which, as they say, is a very large group of people, uh, they have asked every credible presidential candidate for decades, okay, if you win the election... Are you going to come clean? Are you gonna, are you going to open up the vaults and show us all this evidence, or, or tell us what's really at Area Fifty One, or all these kinds of things? So it is, in some ways, even beyond Harry Reid, a political issue. It's fascinating. I'm trying to think about, you know, you're saying basically that there isn't anything, anything at Area Fifty One that you, you know, that if we open up the vault or open up these these papers or whatever they're saying that they have, you're basically saying they're not going to find anything. Why would they then keep that so so? I don't want to get into conspiracy theory, but your thoughts about why that the government would continue to kind of almost put out or underscore or allow people to believe that there are secret documents. Yeah, well, uh, people love that, particularly Americans love it. The idea that the government is keeping secrets from them on something important, or at least profound. And, you know, Americans love conspiracy theories. That's probably not new to you. Uh, really? and, more so, <laughs> and more so than other countries. I mean, I lived in Europe for 13 years. and You know, nobody would, would support that idea. Oh, there, there's a secret vault. They're keeping this. But I mean, on the face of it, it doesn't make too much sense that here's something that's really important to know that we're being visited by beings from some other place. But the government has all the good evidences keeping it locked up. And if you ask people, well, wait a minute, why would they do that? Right. Why is the government trying to be so secretive? And they'll say, well, you know, the public would go nuts if they knew something like this. And of course, that, that doesn't make any sense. Anyhow, because one third of them already believe it's true. Seth, you are one of the hosts of the radio program, Big Picture Science, um, and you work especially with young people to get them excited about astrobiology and science in general. How has working in this atmosphere, working on those goals in this atmosphere of, you know, disrespect for science 
and conspiracy theory. How has that affected your work? And what what can you see from your vantage point that that people who don't do that work might want to know? Well, to begin with, and actually to answer your earlier question, which I somehow studiously ignored answering. I don't know. Why. What are you on the Supreme Court Judicial Co uh, Committee if not answering yeah. questions? Well, I, you know, I take my cue from television. But <laughs> it, <laughs> the thing is that actually President Trump actually likes space. Right. So the NASA budget has not been attacked. It's actually gone up at its traditional rates or it keeps up with inflation. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little less, but that hasn't changed. And I think it's because, you know, space appeals to him. I mean, he started the space force after all. Right. So, uh, you know, that hasn't had a direct effect. But in terms of science, everybody says trust the science, you know, or listen to the scientists. I, well, I, you know, as a scientist, I think, well, that'd be great. You know, if I, if I went <laughs> to parties and people listen to me, well, that'd be, you know, at least novel. But, <laughs> but you know, trusting the science. It sounds good. What does it mean? It means that if the scientists say, look, you can substantially save tens of thousands of lives if people just wear a stupid mask and, and, and you know, the, the government comes out against that. That, that is so bizarre. But, I'm, you know, I live in a bubble here. I hate to say it. The Silicon Valley, you know, I go into the schools if I do, and I do occasionally. Uh, not these days. Not it's anymore. <laughs> not anymore. But if you go to it's over. It, it, you talk to the kids. <laughs> You know, the kids are very interested in science, not all of them, but a substantial fraction. And for them, it is not a, it's a non issue. Uh, science has the allure of not the white lab coats they are not very fashionable. But the allure of science is the fact that it can explain things. And they quickly pick up on that, that there's oh, when you see something that, you, you know, some phenomenon, why are the clouds dark or what, why this? Why that? Why is the sky blue? They're very simple questions every kid will ask that science actually can give you an answer. And they, they, they notice that. And I don't see a tremendous difference there. But again, I'm here in the Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, this is not typical. I suppose if I were in Bloomington, Indiana, it might be a little different. Nothing you, against Indiana, but. Well, culturally different, yes. One third of the American public, as we just getting back to that original topic, thinks that aliens are visiting our planet. And you are basically saying that's not true, but are you one of the one third? No, actually, I'm not, but I am involved with them. It's not my job description to worry about, you know, intruders from deep space, right? But I get calls every day, right? I get emails. You got this call. <laughs> I got this call. This call right now. This call right now. Well, but this one's a little different because all the other calls begin usually. All right, Dr. Shostak, I've got something here you're going to find very interesting. When they say that, I know exactly what's coming next. They have seen something. They're in touch with the aliens. You'd be surprised how many American citizens have uh, relationships with the aliens, and they're not always savory. So, oh, <laughs> yes, I've heard of this probing <laughs> and whatnot. You, I've seen it on The Simpsons. You, so <laughs> basically, the only thing that's going to convince you that extraterrestrial life happens is if you pick it up with the sensitive equipment that you are using at SETI. Is that right? Just for you, not for the rest of us, but. Yeah, no. And I think for the rest probably as well, because in the end, you know, the advantage of a, a scientific experiment is it doesn't depend on witness testimony, which is what the UFO crowd mostly relies on. You know, somebody sees something, I know what I saw. They always know what they saw, even though it's called a UFO because it's unidentified. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know what they saw. And that's the whole point. But, you know, if we were to pick up the signal and say, well, this is it, Bob, we finally found the aliens, you know, there would be people with similar equipment elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the world, and they would immediately, you know, jump into their labs, as it were, and, and try and prove us wrong, because that's the way science works. And, uh, but if they, if they prove us right, then you have a reason to believe it. Seth Shostak, you have, um, I have enjoyed this conversation. You have disappointed me again. I always call thinking <laughs> I'm going to hear... Well, <laughs> this time from Mars or wherever. Yeah. Um, have you Venus, maybe. <laughs> Ooh, is that is that the closest hope? Well, no, no, that might be the closest hope for life. Actually, there was there was a big story about a month ago that there might oh. be. Oh well, the, well, it was uh, you know this was sort of front page news. A group of uh, scientists. I know, but we didn't have you on at that point, so we didn't get a chance. Yeah, well, okay, so then it went back to the comic section, but it's actually it's. It, Important story. There are a bunch of scientists, um, quite a few of whom are in Europe, and the others are at MIT, place like that. They have some evidence that there might be life 
on Venus. Well, not on Venus. If you go to the surface of Venus, I don't recommend you do that. It's about 800 degrees on a, on a cool day. So that's, you know, you're not going to live down there. Nothing's going to live down there. But if you okay. go up in the clouds, you go up in the clouds, 30 miles, because the clouds are very thick, the whole layer. It seems to be that there might be some floating life there, you know, wow. bacteria, not, not, you know, giant lizards or anything. Hmm. But that would be astounding to find that Venus, this hellish hothouse, actually has some some life actually that's very helpful because pretty soon with climate change we're going to be a hellish hot house and it's nice to know that at least some bacteria might survive and repopulate the earth you know if it's a comfort to you it's good to know that that the bacteria are really tough they're like the cockroaches right they're really tough no matter what you do they'll be around ah <laughs> so true Sasha uh final thoughts for today final thoughts for today um uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I should, uh, you know, end on an upbeat note. I, I think that there's there's something upbeat about you know science stories. Obviously, I'm pushing something here, but it's only that science is usually about good news. It's very seldom about bad news. Yes, climate change is bad news. Climate change is bad news. I don't want to just you know uh, pad my part here, but I will say that in terms of climate change, I was talking to a guy who's a uh, professor at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And he was pointing out the fact that we don't worry about fungal infections. I mean, maybe you get athlete's foot, but you worry about bacteria, you worry about viruses. But the, with the global increase in temperature, just a few degrees, it turns out that there are some fungi that can survive the 98.6 degree temperature of your body. And uh, some of these are killing people around the world. So this is a whole new well, thing. Well, that's horrendous. Yeah, it's a whole, whole new side to climate change you may not have thought about. So don't get new touch those mushrooms in the forest when I'm hiking is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, those fungi are okay mostly, but uh, these, these fungi, they're, they're much smaller. They're like yeast. They're it's like not yeast. fun guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fun guy is the, the, the fellow that you met in Queens. No, fungi <laughs> are... <laughs> you're the fun guy. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Anyhow, just oh. something to think about. That is uh, interesting. Do we have antifungals? I, I've heard of these things. Yeah, well, we do. I mean, you know, if you have a fungus infection in your toenail, you can buy, you know, there are things. There's uh, a fungus among us. Yeah, but, but in general, we don't. In general, because, you know, it's never been really a problem. What protects us from the fungi are the, uh, is the fact that you're at 98.6. That's why they attack dead logs in the forest and not you. The logs are hotter than me. That's the sad. Logs are cooler. The logs are cooler than you. Yeah, oh, these ones I like it I'm cool hot. and dark. And right. but now some of them don't mind that you're almost at a hundred degrees. Wow, that's very disturbing. Seth, what's coming up on Big Picture Science this week? Yeah, well, we're doing a show which includes actually that interview, uh, several interviews Ooh. where we talk about you know warming blobs in the ocean. It's, it's kind of a climate change show, but rather than you know going over the usual territory, we're trying to say, look, you know, a few degrees doesn't sound like it would affect anything. Maybe you just have to keep your air conditioner on a little bit longer every year. But in fact, there are all sorts of effects that get pushed over the edge when you just raise the temperature by a few degrees. And some of them are very unpleasant, such as the rise of the fungi. I haven't heard of the rise of the fungi, so I really appreciate talking to you. It was a you. good film. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate, I am having wanting to make Trump penis jokes right now. But anyway, <laughs> I'll just let that go for the morning. And uh, you can see my Twitter feed if you would like a bunch of Trump penis fungi jokes. I just, anyway, let's let that go. Seth Shostak, thank you so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Find Seth's work. Well, follow Seth on Twitter at Seth Shostak, not too hard. Seth in the normal way, S-H-O-S-T-A-K. And uh, also check out the radio program, Big Picture Science, which is on the radio, but also you can get it via podcast the way I do. Seth, thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to your next visit here on the program. Me too, Juliana. Thank you. You're watching Act TV. Don't forget to subscribe and like us here if you're watching on YouTube. That's what we do. We have conversations that are interesting, hopefully, and even important. I don't know about this one. No, just kidding, Seth, if you're still listening. Bless you. He's fun. Um, okay, thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow when guess who we have on? Greg Palast is coming on to talk about voter...
disenfranchisement, voter suppression, and all. I mean, it's going to be like a three-hour conversation. So get in on it. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.